Hi everyone, we're here at DevOps 2014 and I'm here with people that know a thing or two about Java. And uh, I think you guys have read uh, Effective Java, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is Emin, this is Christian, and we're here to talk about um, annotation processing, uh, code generation, and two specific projects. So why don't we start with uh, annotation processing. For, for those that haven't been exposed to it, you want to explain sure. what that is? So it's something that was introduced as a standard with uh, Java 6. So there was a JSR that defined that, and there's a set of APIs that define it. And it's basically a way of extending the Java processor, plugging your own code into the Java processor that will run while compilation is running. And it's, it's quite powerful. You can follow these standard APIs, which will work with uh, both Java C and ECJ, because it is a standard. And uh, you can arrange that when the compilation happens, your code gets executed, and that code can see what other code is being compiled. And it can also generate new code that will be compiled alongside the, the original code. So doing that means that you can, uh, first of all, you can do additional checks because you can you can uh, emit error messages and they will show up in the right place. Mm -hmm. If you're using an IDE, they will show up as red lines. There's a problem here. And secondly, then you can you can augment the code, the input code of your program with this new generated code. So the fact that it's at the uh, compiler level obviously means that you still get the benefit of using, you mentioned an IDE and, and yes. an old tool chain, and that, yes. that is very critical. How about performance? Is that something that it's, people need to worry it's about? It's not something that we've noticed as a problem, so okay. I think it's, it's probably all right. So uh, the reason uh, you were here talking about annotation processing and that we're talking about it now is that this enables for some interesting features, and one of the projects you've been working on is uh, auto values that the proper name? Yes. And that's uh, a project on its own. Can we say it's built by the Guava team? Yeah. Yes. Some relation it's, it's, to it's it? It's part of a larger uh, effort of projects that all do annotation processing uh, for various purposes. Auto value does value type. Uh, really easy, low boilerplate value right. types. So, yeah, I mean, auto value, if I mentioned effective Java, if you haven't read it, guys watching this and gals, uh, you should read it. Uh, it talks about you know how you have to implement you know equals hash code. What else? Yes. What is so the third one? Uh, two string. Two string. Thank yeah. you. So, um, so and that's a major pain, right? And that and that is painful. Yes. But why? Remind us why do you need to do that and how are you solving so this? So you you don't absolutely have to Im implement two string, but you really want to implement equals and hash code so that you can use your values as keys in like hash map or hash set. Um, if you have equals, that means you can use it in, in tests, so you can compare your object against uh, oh. an expected object and so on. So you pretty much always want to define these methods uh, when you're creating a value type. So an immutable type, you really want to define these, these methods. And it's a huge pain because you're doing it exactly the same way every time. Uh, so the idea of auto value is instead of, uh, well, so you define basically abstract methods that are the properties of your object. So uh -huh. your, your class is an address, you say abstract class address. Uh, and you say abstract string, street address, abstract in, postcode, and so on. Uh, and you put the auto value an annotation on that class. And so the idea with the um, auto value annotation processor is that it sees this annotation and that causes it to generate basically new code, which is the implementation of this class. So you have this abstract class, which is the interface that the client code sees, and then you have an, a sort of private implementation of that class, a subclass, okay. um, that basically writes those methods for you. So it writes the implementations of those two abstract methods that you defined, and it also writes the implementation of the equals and hash code and two string methods. So it's a simple idea, but it's just a huge uh, benefit in terms of avoiding having to rewrite the same sorts of things over and over again. So uh, if I want to use it, it's like a jar I add? Yeah, you, is it? The, the easiest way to do it is with Maven. I mean, you just express a dependency on it with Maven and everything just works. Yeah. yeah. And, have the, and, and this has no impact on any uh, jar that you generate, right? This is this is all tooling. Yes, that's right. Yes. This is tooling. Although yeah. the generated code goes in your jar. Yeah. We we actually made a choice to generate source code, not byte right, code. But it's not like you're, precisely you're so you could go and look at it. You're not yes. carrying along a library or no, no, no. This huge dependency. Uh, always yeah. auto value in particular is defined to be completely yeah. standalone. It doesn't depend on anything else in terms of what's generated. Yeah, Java six and above. Yeah. Yes. yes. And ways. and your your. Configuring the compiler with the jar. You're not configuring your runtime with right, the jar. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, so. It's really at the uh, compile time. Yeah, for sure. So um, there's more to it than just generating this. I know there's some you know, nice additional features that people might want to use that, that is part of this. So uh, 
you know, when it comes to declaring things to, as being nullable, for example? Oh, right, yes. So it does do a certain amount of... So it does... Optionally. Optionally, yes. You can specify... See, if you don't specify a parameter as nullable, then the generated constructor, actu constructor will actually verify that it's not null. So there's, a, there's, like, there's some, a few things like that. We have uh, GWT serialization, GWT serialization, for example. Okay. So a few extra bells and whistles, whistles like that, yeah. Okay, so if you haven't checked it out... And it's, uh, what is the status of that project? I mean, in terms of we how, have how, how, how it, it's in it a, is. It's in a uh, uh, release candidate, and we had a discussion yesterday where we couldn't think of a good reason not to release 1.0. So uh, I you suspect we'll release 1.0 really soon really now. Soon now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's you know a little bit of touching up in terms of the outer features and maybe some documentation improvements. But we've been using it in production code at Google for quite a while now at Head. Uh, yes. And it hasn't changed much in the last couple of months. We and it is good. an open source project developed yes. in the open source. It's on thing. GitHub. It's the GitHub in the Google project space uh, called Auto, A U T O. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, let's switch gears a little bit and sure. talk about something, Christian, you've been spending some time on, which yeah. is Dagger, which is really, when you look at it, another use of annotation processing where yep. a lot of work is done at the compile time, so that in terms of performance, startup time, and many other things. Yeah. Um, you don't have to do at, at runtime. So yeah. tell us how you use, what is Dagger real quickly so and, and how the uses APT. Yeah, so uh, Dagger is in essence a JSR 330 compliant uh, uh, dependency injection framework. At inject. At inject. Uh, you, just like every other dependency injection framework these days, you have classes that you ha control the constructor for and you can mark add inject on the constructor and then they declare their dependencies as constructor parameters or you have a configuration for things that can't have constructors like interfaces that need to be bound and we have uh, some annotations at module for the module configuration classes and app provides to declare the methods that will provide these types that you don't have constructors for and uh, what it does is it looks at these annotation signals and says hey what are the dependencies that were declared and can we satisfy these with all of the things that we know uh, and then it just does that work for you. So traditionally, things like Spring and Juice, etc., would use reflection at runtime to analyze these signals and yank them all together. Uh, and what we wanted was, first of all, uh, to have some improved import performance on Android. And reflection is pretty slow on Delvic, and so that was one of the inceptions of Dagger, uh, one of the motivations for it. Uh, secondly, we wanted to move errors from runtime late in the game to compile times. It's always good to move your errors forward. And with annotation processors, we found a way that we could generate code that could do what the reflection did because we did the reflective analysis at compile time. Right. And we could also emit the errors and warnings, as Eamon mentioned. Right. Uh, so we could actually turn these wiring errors that you would normally have to like do some kind of a, a, an internal logging system or an internal, you know, uh, uh, observation to figure out what is my wiring, you can now see it at compile time, you know when you got it wrong, and it'll, you know, catch cycles and all of these sorts of things. So you mentioned that uh, mobile and Android in particular was the motive time motivation. That's the this, original, yeah. The original one. So yeah. has this evolved? Because it sounds like... Has evolved. Yes, there are a number of things you cannot do because you're doing stuff at compile time, so you, you cannot yeah. be as dynamic and... Yeah, as and, and to be clear, we've never... We've never had it as a goal to be as fully dynamic as the runtime-based uh, dependency injection systems. Like, Juice will always have more capabilities because it can dynamically slurp things up at the last minute, which we will never be able to do quite the same. Although we found that a lot of places where we were using reflection, like graph analysis, for example, that we're doing at compile time, there are other kinds of sort of the, the assembling of new things that is often done at reflection that we found we can also do at compile time. So we have uh, some people that had implemented plug-in systems on top of Juice, and they were trying to use Dagger, and they are like, well, how do we do that? Because we right. can't dynamically build the, the shell around this thing because it's static, and they just turned their plug-in into a Dagger-like annotation processor system, so they would generate Dagger modules, which then our processor would generate the resulting DI code for, and it just works amazingly well for that sort of thing. So we just kept pushing the, the reflection problem further out uh, and got a lot of the benefits in even 
even layers on top of Dagger. It's kind of fascinating. So same question is for uh, Auto Value. What is uh, Dagger 2? We're talking mostly yeah. about Dagger 2 here, by yeah. the way. I, I should mention, so Dagger 1 did the exact same thing we're talking about, but Dagger 2, we went fully compile time. There was still some loading that was going on in reflection, and we've, we've eliminated all of that with Dagger 2. Yeah. And then where, where, where are we now? Can I so use Dagger 2? You what, can, what, what has Google been doing you know, in terms of contributing and using Dagger 2? So, uh, Dagger 1 was a, a joint project with Google and Square. Dagger 2 is still a joint project in that Square's been consulting with us and helping and, and you know, we've been workshopping all of the ideas with the Square guys. Uh, but primarily the implementation has been written inside Google. Uh, we are using it in production on a couple of servers and quite a few Android applications, Dagger 2. So at head it works. Uh, it's missing a lot of important things like the validations aren't fully built out. So if you get errors sometimes in your graph, you'll sometimes get a stack trace where you should get a nice error. And that's just stuff we have to improve and work on. Uh, it's in a pre-alpha state. We haven't released a formal alpha, but we are pushing snapshots to Sonatype's uh, snapshot repository. So okay. if you use Maven, you can use Dagger uh, 2 as 2.0-snapshot version, and you'll just get the latest from head. Okay. Uh, every time we push to GitHub, we get a new version pushed out to Sonatype automatically. So, so for, for those people that have a, an issue with snapshots, how long would it, would it be before? We're, we're hoping to put together a, a, some sort of a developer preview in the next couple of weeks. Uh, couple of weeks. We just couple updated weeks. the documentation on the, on the website, so it is actually, there is some documentation now for 2.0, uh, so you can get a sense of how to use it. Uh, now that we've done a couple of talks, and Jake Wharton's doing a talk later today uh, here at the conference, um, so we think people will be in good shape to receive a, a, a developer preview in the next couple of weeks. Great. Yeah. Well, uh, so I guess uh, that's all the time we have for uh, Christian Emmon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Auto value, Dagger, all powered by annotation processing and uh, yep. with super low overhead, no runtime dependency or whatsoever. So um, thanks for answering my questions. Yeah, our pleasure. And okay. do check out those projects. Thanks. Thank yeah, you very thank much. You. Thanks.